Boy, that takes us back to a whole different era. Uh, we've probably been doing that song since almost the beginning, I imagine. Uh, as, as is this song. Well, we'll send this one out to Buzzy. That was his song, right? Something that we introduced not too long back, a little while back, I guess, before you went away forever, <laughs> down to Puerto Rico. <laughs> yep. Yep. Now you guys might recognize this one. Are you too scared to move and walk out of this tomb? Buried underneath the lies that you believe. Safe and sound, stuck in the ground, too lost to be found. You're just asleep, and it's time to leave. Come on, rise up, take a breath, you're alive. Out from the grave like Lazarus, you're 
everything was more than blood. It's the kind of blood that washes sins away. Now the door is open wide. The roads are rolled aside. The old is gone. The light has come. So come on, that night. Take a breath, you're alive. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Happy Hour at the World Famous Salvation Saloon. And for those of you who may just be here for the very first time, there's always a, a couple of you out there, we always like to start our services out by letting you guys know we are so glad you guys are here, and we truly believe God's going to bless you guys today. Uh, there is one thing we would ask of you, though, if you don't mind, and that is if you just grab one of these little yellow cards that you see all over the place, if you would, just throw your name in that. Tell us where you're from. That'd be cool. Uh, but then if you don't mind, if you just hold on to this card uh, till the end of the service and write down the bottom in the comment section, tell us what, what you thought. We're always kind of curious. So if you do that, that would be great. Um, uh, but again, uh, we just want you to know that uh, from here on out, you're our guest. So sit back, hang on, enjoy the ride. Um, everyone else knows we do have some of the purposes for these cards, though, and that is if there happens to be a birthday or an anniversary, it could be just about anything that you think we got to know about, put it on this card one week in advance. But the main reason we have these cards is for prayer. So if you're here and you have a need in your life, uh, put that need down on this card uh, and give God an opportunity to show himself strong because prayer does work. Amen, people? Amen. This is what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that... Our God is a present help in times of trouble, uh, but also tells us that sometimes we have not because we ask not. So again, put your needs down uh, here on this card. Now, speaking of prayer, and, and this is something I probably should do a little more often, um, I'm going to share just a few praise reports uh, with you guys. Um, one of them is a couple of weeks ago when we sent the prayer list out. Uh, Mike Baker was on that uh, list because um, he had some medical tests that were uh, going to be done. Now, to give you a little background information on that, um, they found a, uh, a, a spot or, or a tumor on his bladder. The doctor was quite sure it was cancerous. The doc doctor uh, actually uh, gave Mike about two years to live, um, and so he ended up going in, and uh, they ended up uh, putting a scope in. This was last week. And, um, and you guys have been praying for him. 
Um, but they put that scope in, and, and as it went up, and it went, went up to that area where that tumor was, as soon as it hit that tumor, it, it just dissolved, and it fell apart right there. And the doctor yeah. said he's never seen anything like it before. Um, so we got Mike for, for a little bit longer, uh, which is good because he's a very entertaining guy. <laughs> I hope I told that all right. I, I, I think I got most of that right. Uh, anyways, also, you guys know that Suzanne, my wife, uh, had a shoulder operation last week. Um, her shoulder was really a, a, just a huge uh, mess. And uh, um, the doctor was saying it was, you know, could be a very long operation. He had so much stuff to do. He had um, several tendons that he had to cut and reattach and um, all, all kinds of other stuff. Anyways, he gave me a call. Thank you guys for praying. Um, he gave me a call after the operation. He said when they got in there, he said it was as bad or worse than what they thought. Um, but he said it was amazing. He said everything. He said I didn't have to pull or tug or, or scrape or, or anything. He said everything just fell together perfectly. It's never happened before. And he said her recovery uh, should be much better because of it. And... Um, it's been amazing this week. Uh, very little pain, and uh, yeah. uh, you know what? That is prayer. I truly believe that is that's prayer. Uh, God is good, right? And He is alive and well on planet Earth. He's still changing lives. He's still meeting needs, and uh, so thank you, Jesus, for that. All right, moving right along here at the saloon. We are a family, like every family. We try to make sure that we recognize each other, and uh, I think we got us an anniversary, don't we, Rob? Happy Yo. anniversary, ah. happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary. Pour a cheerful toast and fill it, happy anniversary. But be careful you don't spill it, happy anniversary. Oh, happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary. All right, all right, congratulations, guys. We have no birthdays this week, which is kind of rare, but there is a game we play each and every week. And the name of that game is Name That Salunatic. Now, if you are here for the first time, just so you do uh, know, we do call our congregation members Salunatics. And uh, every week what we do is we try to get a picture, usually an old picture, and we throw it up and try to guess who it is. So see what you guys can do with this picture. See if you can tell me who this Salunatic is. Who's that? <laughs> Anna thinks it's Rob. No. Pastor Bill? Jimmy? Any other guesses? Well, let's find out. Well, the real Salunatic, please stand up. And it is. It's Rob Schuster. Look at that. All right, very good. All right. I actually don't have anything else to pass on to you guys, so we're just going to get right into it. Uh, of course, we need to start things out right by, um, by uh, opening the service up uh, with uh, prayer. And uh, since Dave's up here, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. All right. Well, uh, once again, welcome to the saloon. And I think it's going to be a wonderful day today. We're going to have a wonderful message. But most importantly, we're going to be here in worship, uh, praise the Lord, and give back to the Lord as he has given to us. And we are so blessed. I, don't, I can't even count the number of blessings I get from the Lord, and especially this week. It's been wonderful. So this is the time that we offer up our, our offering. Um, and uh, while we do that, let's, uh, let's pray over this service. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all of the wonderful things you've done for us, the things that you give us, the the support that you give us and the courage that you give us to face this world because it would just be horrifying if we had to face it without you. So we thank you so much that you've been with us and that uh, uh, we can serve you and that we can honor you with our offerings and hopefully we can take this, this offering that we give and do some wonderful things within this community with it to, to reach out and touch people's lives that need to be touched and hear your word and, and feel your glory. So we thank you so much for everything that you've done. Bless, our, bless this service. Bless this offering. This we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. Well, we have got a special treat. 
Just, this for, is just a, 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 an aside here, I want to congratulate everybody on the synchronous clapping. <laughs> Much better, much better. Well, some of them are clapping in 4-4, four, four, and some of them are clapping in 3-4. But they were wonderful. <laughs> but it all works. It works one way or the other. At any rate. Uh, there's one guy that we've done, we do several songs by, a guy by the name of Keb Moe. And I've been a big fan of his. seen him a couple of times in concert right down here in Clearwater. And he just came out with a new album um, not too long ago. And listening to the album, I found, saw this one song on there, found this one song. It's called uh, Good to Be Home Again. And at the time, we were going through a separation anxiety <laughs> with Anna gone. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> and it's been, it's been a long couple of months with uh, uh, you know, Anna going down to Puerto Rico and being gone and just several people gone. And, uh, uh, you know, I started to think about, you know, the, the nature of what he was writing about. And it's like, you know what? It is good to be home again, but... Home is where your heart is, right? And as far as my heart, this is home. Amen. You know, so this is where I want to be. If I've been away for a while, I don't feel at home until I walk in here at the saloon because this is where my spiritual family is, people I care about, uh, the people that know me and I know them. So we took that song and I rewrote some of the words. Tell me what you think.
All right. Well, thank you, Nitty Gritty Church, man. That's some good style. I like that new song. Amen? All right. All right, we've been studying the gospel of Luke. Um, and today, today we're going to begin Luke chapter 9. And uh, up to this point, the disciples have been following Jesus, and they've been watching him minister hope everywhere uh, that he went uh, through healings and deliverances and by preaching the gospel. But now, uh, Jesus is going to actually send them out uh, to do the very same things in his name. So, as a father has sent me, uh, I now also send you. Because up to now, uh, they've essentially, the disciples have essentially been in, in training. They've been kind of like the, the Jesus boot camp. Uh, but now uh, Jesus is going to send them out on their own without him uh, and uh, so that they can apply what they've learned. So um, what this is is kind of like uh, he's, he's giving them a trial run, kind of kind of like going on their uh, first solo flight. Because although they do not understand it as of yet, um, Jesus is only going to be with them for a little time longer. And then, then his mission is actually going to be passed on to them to carry on. And so uh, it all goes down in verse 1 like this, as it says. When Jesus had called the, the 12 disciples, um, Jesus had called the 12 disciples and he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases. Now right there... Um, we see the ability to minister to the whole people, uh, the whole person, right? Because that is both, uh, that's taking care of both physical and spiritual needs. Uh, also in verse 2, he sent them out to proclaim uh, the kingdom of God. Um, and, and that is actually, that's the primary mission, right? And then the secondary mission would be, uh, as it says, to heal the sick. So the main agenda was to proclaim Jesus as the king who had come to reveal uh, his kingdom, but not a physical kingdom, right? Not the physical kingdom that many had expected the Messiah to, to bring, um, but Jesus came to bring a spiritual kingdom, right? Uh, to build a spiritual kingdom within the hearts of man, right? And that is why Jesus said that the kingdom of God is, is within us, amen? Um, and it's in us by way of a spiritual transformation, right? Or spiritual rebirth, right? As Ephesians chapter 2 states, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 says that you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and trespasses and sins. And there it is. There's that born again experience. Uh, the born again experience that's available to all mankind who simply places their faith in, in Jesus and in, in Jesus as their Savior. So again, primary mission is man's salvation, right? But along with that, Jesus has also equipped them to deal with uh, kind of like the social work of the ministry, and, and that would be their, their physical needs. Uh, and then in verse 3, Jesus gives them this piece of instruction. He, he tells them to take nothing for the journey, right? No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. All right, so Jesus is basically saying, I want, I want you guys to travel light. Now, normally... I mean, we would think that, you know, it would be, it's always wise to prepare for, for a journey, right? But um, uh, prepare for a journey by, well, taking the things we, we know that we would, we know we're going to need, right? And especially here with, like, the essentials like food and, and money, obviously. Um, because as these guys are going out, I mean, how are they going to be able to help others if, if they end up, you know, not even being able to, to help themselves. Uh, but Jesus has a very important purpose behind this command here. And that is, well, it's going to teach them to be dependent on God, right? Uh, and that is something that they especially really need to learn because, you know, as I just said, Jesus isn't going to always be there with them, right? At least not physically. So they need to learn how to rely on God. And that's kind of what this is all about. Uh, now, as far as the social work, attending to the sick, well, they're not going to need any special medical supplies for that um, because all they're going to need for that is they're just going to need the name of Jesus. Amen? That's all they're going to need. Um, but then Jesus adds this instruction in verse 4 when he says, Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. And in verse 5, 
If people do not welcome you, then leave their town and shake the, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So their job is, is to just go and, and preach the gospel, right? But the results, okay, although it mattered, um, that's really not their concern, right? Because as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul said it's our duty, uh, our duty is to just plant the seed, right? And then someone else may come along and they may water that seed, but it's God that's going to make it grow. Amen. God's the one who's, who's going to make it grow. So it's their job just to get out there and, and to preach, preach the word. Um, and then it's God's job to then take it from there. So when these guys leave, right, they, they, they come to some town and, and they're on their way out. Um, despite how things kind of went down and whether they were accepted or not, they don't need to be getting all bummed out. They don't need to be carrying that rejection with them when they leave. Um, but they just need to shake it off, and they need to keep on keeping on. Uh, anyways, Jesus had just kind of given them their marching orders. And, and in verse 6, it says that they set out, and they went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. So uh, we see they're having some, some great success here. Uh, and the news of their success was spreading, because as we go to verse 7, it now tells us that Herod the Tetrarch, okay, and the, uh, that tells us that Herod, Herod was one of the uh, governors of, of Judea. There was four of them. Um, well, it says that he heard about all that was going on, but it tells us this. tells us that he was perplexed because some were saying that John, right, he's talk, we're talking about John the Baptist here, John had been raised from the dead. So rumors are flying around uh, that old John was, was involved here. While in verse 8, others were saying, there were some other rumors flying around, and that would be that Elijah had appeared and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. Now, as for John, the last we heard from him, uh, he was in jail. Uh, in fact, he was in Herod's jail, right? And that is why Herod is, is perplexed here uh, because in verse 9, well, we see old Herod is he's kind of scratching his head um, because he knows this. He knows that I beheaded John. I beheaded John. How can this be John? Now, if you don't know the story, Herod had this, uh, this chicky poo dance for him, and he was so pleased with, with this chicky poo that he told her that he'd give her anything she wanted. And so when that innocent little sweetheart asked for John's head on a platter, um, Herod didn't want to do it, but because he had made a, a, a public oath, well, he was kind of forced to, to follow through. And so that is how the uh, death of John the Baptist actually went down. But now, you know, Herod's hearing all this stuff, and he's wondering, you know, who is this? Yeah, who is this? I, I hear such things about, and it says that he tried to see him. Now, in Mark's gospel, it, it tells us that Herod was actually afraid that maybe John did rise from the dead. Right, and since he was the one who had killed uh, John, well, his guilty conscience has uh, caused him to be a little concerned here. You know, I guess you know, like he thought he was going to be on an episode of The Walking Dead. Um, but, anyways, back to Jesus and the disciples. Well, in verse ten, it tells us this: tells us that when they returned, right, the disciples returned, uh, but now it calls them apostles. So when the apostles returned. They reported to Jesus what they had done. Now, that's interesting. And, and it's interesting is, is because when they left, again, they were called disciples, um, which basically means that they were students. They left as students. But now that, they, that they've returned from the mission field, well, we see that they are now called apostles, um, which means an apostle are those who are sent by God and with God's uh, authority. So... Um, they've just, just received a nice promotion here. Uh, anyways, they've all returned and, and uh, reported to Jesus, right? They're, they're telling them about all the cool stories, you know, about what uh, God had done through them. Uh, and that is actually exactly what we do each day when we're on the Bronson Project. You know, we would do the same thing. We, we would come back at the end of the day, we'd get together, and then we would share with each other all the things that God had accomplished and uh, sometimes, sometimes there was some pretty amazing uh, things, and uh, it, it was pretty humbling. Amen, guys? Um, 
But moving on, then it tells us this, tells us that he, Jesus, he then took them with him, took his, his disciples, his apostles with him, and uh, after they had gone out and come back, um, they withdrew uh, by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. Now, we know this. We know that Jesus would often withdraw himself, right, to, to spend that alone time with his father, right? And, and here, well, now that, they, that they're participating in ministry as well, then um, they also need to be taking time, uh, taking that time to have prayer and, and, and have that solitude with God, right? So that they can be encouraged, right? God can encourage them and strengthen them so they can continue on. But in verse 11, as was often the situation, tells us that the crowds learned about it and they were following him, right? Um, well, this is what we know as we've been reading through this. We know that everybody wanted a piece of Jesus, right? Everybody wanted their own miracle. And, and that caused the demand on Jesus to really get uh, out of control. But still, still, Jesus just could not turn anyone away, right? Because as Mark's gospel had stated, uh, Mark tells us that Jesus was just overcome with this great compassion for, for all these people, right? Because just as prophecy had stated, um, man, they were like lost sheep. They were like lost sheep, like sheep w without a shepherd. And, and so as it now says, Jesus has compassion on them, and so he welcomed them. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and he healed those who needed healing. But now in verse 12, tells us this, tells us that late in the afternoon, um, the 12 uh, came to him and they said, uh, you know, Lord, we, we need to s send the crowd away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside uh, and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place place here. So this place that they withdrew to, um, wasn't any McDonald's around, right? Uh, not even a convenience store to, to, to grab a hot dog, right? So they, they got no options here. But in verse 13, uh, Jesus says this. Jesus replies by saying, hey, how about you guys give them something to eat, right? But they answer by saying, hey, we only have five loaves of, of bread and two fish, right? And unless we go uh, out and buy some food for, for this crowd. Now, but again, they're traveling light. All right, so how in the world could they afford that? Because it's in verse 14 that we learn that, man, we're, we're talking about 5,000 men, right? There were about 5,000 men there. So that's 5,000 men, not including the women and children. A lot of mouths to feed, right? But Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, Ah, that's okay. Just have them sit down. Have them sit down in groups of about 50. And so in verse 15, disciples did so, and everyone sat down. And in verse 16, Jesus, taking the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, says he gave thanks. He gave thanks, and he broke them, separated them, and he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. Now, this prayer by Jesus here is significant. Because it, it's a prayer that gives thanks uh, to God for what we have, right? And as we're about to see, um, this power in being thankful to God, right? The God who is the source of all that we possess. And, and what are the results when we recognize our God as our source? Well, according to the Old Testament, it results in provision, right? Because God in the Old Testament was also called Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. What does that name mean? What does the name Jehovah Jireh mean? It means he's the God that's more than enough. Our God is a God that is more than enough, which is exactly what we now see in verse 17, because as it says, it says that they all ate. They all ate, and they were all satisfied. And then the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. All right, tells us something, right? Tells us that whatever we have, and regardless of how little that may be, man, if we put it in the hands of Jesus, then there is just no limit to what he can do with it. Amen? And, and I'm thinking that would also include our very lives. Now, we may think that our lives are pretty insignificant, right? And, and we really don't have much to offer God. 
But when we surrender those lies, we surrender them to Jesus, then just as the Bible says, right, the Bible tells us that that's when we become more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. More than conquerors through him who loved us. Because if God be for us, who can be against us? So, as we just saw, Jehovah Jireh shows up and their needs are met. Uh, but now, moving on from there, we're told in verse 18 that uh, once uh, when Jesus was praying private, okay, there it is again, Jesus withdrawing himself to have that alone time with his father, um, and not to be a broken record, but again, right, if that was such a necessity for Jesus, then, man, it's, it's got to be an even bigger necessity for us. Um, we need to have that prayer life, a constant, continual prayer life. Uh, but then, as it says, so Jesus is out praying in private. It says that his disciples were with him. Um, and then Jesus had, had something to ask them. He asked them, who do the crowd say I am? So he's, he's basically saying, what's a popular opinion out there? And in verse 19, well, this is how they replied. They said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. So it's the same exact stuff that, that Herod had also heard. But here's the thing. It was Jesus who asked this first question to now set up uh, this more important question. And it's more important because it's this next question that, that is going to actually determine their eternal destiny. And, and in verse 20, well, here it is. As Jesus now says, but what about you? What about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter, <coughs> Peter answered him back by saying, you are God's Messiah. You are God's Messiah. <coughs> now, in Matthew's gospel, to Peter's answer, well, it was Jesus who then said, right, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, since Peter's name means little stone, um, there's some who, who have claimed that the church was, was built on Peter, right? They say that Peter is the foundation of the church. Um, but there's a biblical problem with that, right? There's, there's a problem with that conclusion, and that is that Scripture states, right, and uh, to give you one, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, it states there that Jesus is the only foundation, right? Jesus is the only foundation that I is recognized by God. So the church is not built on Peter, but actually it was built on that confession that Peter just made, right? That confession. What was that? Um, well, when Peter said that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and the Savior of the world, right? Because only that conclusion can, can cause us to prevail against uh, the gates of hell, right? Which Jesus also confirmed when he said this. He said, I am the only way and I am the only truth that can lead man to eternal life, right? Because just as that old hymn also proclaims, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Amen? But now, after Peter's confession, verse 29 then tells us that Jesus strictly warned them not uh, to tell this to anyone. Now, I mean, that's always kind of weird when you hear stuff like this because you'd think you'd want everyone to know this. Um, but here's the thing. Right now, the, these guys are confused, right? Because the things that Jesus is, is about to tell them, well, it, it's going to be different from the traditional belief that's been passed down to them. Right, which was the belief that when the Messiah came, well, they believed that he would, uh, he would come to set them free from the Roman uh, occupation that was ruling over them. So the people, the, the Jewish people, were basically looking for a political Messiah, a political a Savior, a Messiah that would come and was going to set up a physical kingdom on the earth. But as Jesus would uh, continue to inform them, um, well, he told them that first they would need to establish a spiritual kingdom within their hearts. Um, so that had to come first. And it's in verse 22 that Jesus now lets them know that it, it's not going to play out as, as they had thought. Um, because this is what he said. Jesus says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus just told him he must be killed, 
and on the third day be raised to life. Now, notice it says the Son of Man must, must suffer these things. Well, he must suffer these things because 1 Peter chapter 1 tells us that it was all preordained, right? As it stated there that Jesus would shed his precious blood as a lamb without blemish or defect. And that, it said, was God's plan. And it was God's plan, it said, even before the creation of the world. So, yeah, this is coming as a surprise to these guys, but it, it's, it's really nothing new. Now, it also doesn't tell us here what Peter's response to Jesus was when uh, he just said that he was going to be killed. But in Mark chapter 8, it kind of lays uh, more details out, and it states that Peter, you know, when he heard that, he actually took Jesus and he pulled him aside and, and he rebuked Jesus. Right. For saying such a thing. Right. I mean, he gave Jesus a, a, a tongue lashing kind of straight, tried to straighten him out. Right. Um, but that's when Jesus rebuked Peter in return by saying this. Um, uh, he said, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God. But what you have in mind is the things of man or actually those misinterpreted traditions of of man. Uh, anyways, um, Peter was a beaut, but um, I, I find it kind of funny how one moment, you know, we, we've got Peter the rock, and he has this great, rev great divine revelation of who Jesus is, and then in the very next sentence, he's now discouraging Jesus from the mission that he, the Messiah, had, had come to fulfill. Um, uh, and he had to come and fulfill that, right? It was a must, because if he didn't, then you know what? Man would have been e eternally lost. He would have been eternally lost. And that victory over men's soul would have belonged to Satan. It would have then belonged to Satan, which is why Jesus just said, get behind me, Satan. Uh, anyways, Jesus lays all this on them, um, but at this time still, still doesn't register. Um, but, and, and we've talked about this before, I think we know, um, after the resurrection, though, uh, all of a sudden, it, it's, it's going to make sense, right? It's going to register. Because after it all plays out, that is when the Holy Spirit will cause them to remember all these things that, that Jesus had said. And, and then all those prophetic scriptures that did not make sense to them at, at the time, well, it's going to then all make, make all the sense in the world. By example, uh, Isaiah chapter 53, uh, where... Uh, 700 years before Jesus, well, uh, it had this to say about the life of the Messiah. And, and that is, uh, Isaiah 53 said that he would be despised and rejected by man. Uh, a man of suffering, familiar with pain. But surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. As he was pierced for our transgressions and was crushed for our iniquities. But that punishment that was laid on him would bring us peace. Because we... Uh, all, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and so the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And because he poured out his life unto death, being numbered among the criminals, he bore our penalty and made intercession for all sinners. Now, maybe those verses didn't make any sense in association with that political uh, Messiah that they were looking for, but after the resurrection... It's going to finally all make, make sense to them. So, um, again, Jesus knew exactly what his love for sinners was going to, going to cost him. And that's why the Bible uh, declares that we've been bought with a price. Been bought with a price, right? And, and what that just happens to mean for us is that our salvation was purchased for us, right? It was purchased for us. What, what do we call that? We call that grace, Amen. The grace that through our faith alone will provide us with salvation and by way of a gift from God, right? Because it is not what we can do for Christ, but it's what Christ has done for us. So, you know what? Any way you look at it, um, that's a spiritual bargain right there. That's a spiritual bargain. Uh, but now in verse 23, we're about to find that discipleship, though, does not come quite so cheap. Because here's what Jesus has to say. Uh, it's Jesus who then said this to them all. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up their cross daily and follow me. 
So like it says, to carry our cross means to deny ourselves, right? Or in other words, it, it means to live our lives in submission to God, right? By bearing the cross of God's will and, and not our own will. And, and so it's Jesus who now says in verse 24 that whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. All right. Living for Jesus, yeah, it, it, it may be tough at times, right? It, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's tough not to give our allegiance to, to this world, right? Living in these fleshly bodies, yeah, that's going to be tough. But you know what? In this game of life, that's the only way we're going to win, people. <laughs> it's the only way we're going to win because in verse 25, it's Jesus who then says this. He says, for what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose their own soul? What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose their own soul? All right, I heard this story, story of this dying man uh, who, uh, who had worked really hard his whole life to accumulate this, this uh, large amount of wealth. Now, they say that you can't take it with you, but this guy, this, this guy was going to try, uh, was going to give it a try. And so he, he told his wife that when he died, well, he wanted her to put all his money in, in, in the casket with him. And then he gave her no rest at all uh, until she finally promised to do it. And sure enough, when the man died, when the man finally died, his wife was seen placing the shoebox in, in the casket. Now, one of her friends, you know, went to her and said, you know, I hope you weren't crazy enough to actually put all that stingy man's money in that casket with him. But the wife said this. She said, I promised him I would, and I kept my promise. I went to the bank. I put all his money in one account. And I just placed a check in that shoebox, and now it's going to be up to him to cash it. <laughs> All right. Again, as Jesus just said, though, what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world yet, yet lose his own soul? Bottom line is this. In life, right, it comes down to choices, right? And, and the ultimate choice, as Joshua said, is that we choose in life who we're going to serve. So we can, we, we can choose to please ourselves in the desires of our flesh, or we can choose to please our God, right, by taking up our cross and following him. And in verse 26, it's Jesus who uh, puts it like this, when he says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, well, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the Holy Spirit. All right, holy angels. One day, we're all going to stand be before God, right? And when we do, the only thing that's going to matter is not going to be how successful or influential we were or how much money we have in, in, in the bank. But the only thing that's going to matter is that despite the cost, we chose to live our lives for Christ, right? Because here's, here's a spiritual truth, and that is there is one life to live, and it will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last, right? And that is exactly what Jesus has been emphasizing here in, in this study today, uh, and actually in the last couple of chapters uh, in, in, in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, so let's review. And review, here's a question for us. Who do we say Jesus is? Right? Who do we say that Jesus is? And then the next question would be, then what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? Now, Jesus did just say that there is a cost in serving him, but here's an even uh, bigger consideration that I want to leave with you guys, and, and that is this. Maybe we also need to consider the cost of not serving him. Amen? <laughs> Maybe we should really consider the cost of not serving him. So there it is. That is as far as we're going to go today in chapter 9. Um, I think I've left you guys something to think about and, and pray about this week. Uh, and then next week, next week we'll kind of pick things up from here. We'll, we'll finish chapter 9, um, and we're going to continue to, to learn even more from Jesus. Love, love the Gospels. Uh, anyways, love you guys. I pray you all have a, a blessed week. Thank you so much for your prayers. Um, God is so good. God is so good. So uh, I pray that 
um, God blesses you uh, greatly in return. Uh, and right now I'm going to have uh, Bob Lynn come up, and uh, he's going to pray God's blessing on us as we leave. Love that message. Oh, am I in the right place? Is this one? This one? Okay. Okay. I love that message. I love the music. I was thinking about God says that He inhabits the praises of His people, and we were certainly praising Him with that music. We God says that where two or three are gathered together, He's in our midst. You can feel the love of Christ when I come in this place. Every time I walk in here, I feel the love of Christ. Just what Dave was talking about. This is uh, family. This is home. And uh, I'm reminded in that message, uh, it got me thinking that 52 years ago, I was lost. I was living in a dark, dark well. And I had been through a lot of addictions. I'd been through uh, up and down a lot of blind alleys, dead end streets. And one day, I happened to be away on a trip, and I walked into a phone booth, and I picked up this little track that someone left on a counter in the phone booth. It's called Peace with God. I never went to church. I was an atheist. I was an agnostic. I believed in myself. But at 29 years old, I ran out of myself. And I was contemplating suicide, actually. And I read this little booklet. It was my first exposure to Jesus Christ. And in the little booklet, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Another thing it said is, Come on to me. Jesus said, Come on to me, all you, labor, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I have the privilege of ending the service this morning. This is my first opportunity. And it w I want to end this opportunity by if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ if, as your Lord and Savior, if you're not sure if you're going to heaven, or like in my case, I knew I was living in hell. I knew I was going to hell, but I didn't know what to do about it. If you're not sure of your eternity, or if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and the cares of the world or the physical things or the financial things or just the way the world's going has you so troubled that it's caused you to drift a little bit away from Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you also to pray this prayer to rededicate yourself to Jesus Christ. He's a prayer away. He never moves. He's an ever-present help in time of need. And so if you're at that place as a believer, rededicate to him today. Come back to him. So I'm going to close just by asking you to bow your heads, close your eyes, pray along with me if you want to ask Jesus into your heart. If you've never done that, or if you have done that, and you feel that you've drifted away, to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you that you died on the cross for our sins. And we thank you, Lord, that you came to give us eternal life that whoever believes in you should not perish but have everlasting life. We thank you, Jesus, for knocking on the door of our heart and coming into our hearts. And we want to dedicate ourselves to you. We ask you to make us the person you want us to be, Lord. We thank you that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us, and we have an eternity to look forward to. And we thank you also, Lord, that we are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. 
as we pray in his most holy and blessed name. Amen. Amen. Have a great week.